Yes, now it's this stream is yours, as you mentioned. Stream. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I say I think that you should took an advantage of uh, keeping microphone and camera off. You should drink, eat, enjoy. I don't know. And sometimes, if some something is unclear, please place questions into the chat and immediately sip your coffee and eat something that you have with you. But we have to do it under sun. Okay. At least the sunshine, correct? Correct. <laughs> and now I see uh, the nice question about uh, the butterfly. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much for this. And let me stress your attention that the shape of the butterfly is because of the sun and not because of the earth. The length of the rotation period uh, is these 27 days is because we observe it from the sun. But the butterfly diagram, the shape of the diagram is because of the processes inside the sun. There is something inside the sun that, that is responsible for the appearance of the sunspots at different latitudes. So sometimes they are indeed located only close to the equator. Sometimes they are at uh, the mid latitudes. So it's only the processes, uh, uh, processes in the sun, inside the sun. I lost my presentation. <clears throat> so I posed the question, will anomalous growth in the instantaneous period results in the desynchronization of toroidal and poloidal components of the solar magnetic field nowadays? So let me return, wait for a moment. <clears throat> let me retur return to the previous picture and to recall that in addition to two anomalies, uh, which we observed with a naked eye with solar proxies, we see probably another anomaly. We don't know right now, just looking at this graph. And what is more important that um, the solar proxies themselves do not expose an anomaly um, at the right, anomaly nowadays. So we <clears throat> will try to have another look, you know, we look from another point of view. Uh, the mainstream is, you probably know, uh, is related to partial differential equations, so-called MHD, magnetohydrodynamic equations. They are very, very complicated. First of all, even before you want to solve something, you have to formulate the problem. And even this step is not very clear because you know the equations, you know them from the first principles, but equations have coefficients. How to get the values of the coefficients? You can measure something and derive the coefficients from your measurements. But you can agree that it is not easy to measure something inside the sun, but this is the part of the probe. <clears throat> okay, somehow scientists are able to write the equations. But now we have to solve them. It's difficult to solve partial differential equations 
even numerically. First, astrophysicists perform huge simplifications related, first of all, to some symmetries. You can assume <clears throat> that the sun is a ball to some extent, okay, and simplify the equations. On, on the other side, we do know that uh, the observations are not symmetric. We know uh, different uh, types of asymmetry, uh, axial non symmetry. They are implemented into the system after this uh, simplification of the equations. So you <clears throat> can introduce this non-axial, non, sorry, introduce axial non-symmetry into coefficients of the simplified equations. And then you have opportunity to solve them numerically. And this is the mainstream. We can discuss how good or bad this mainstream, but this is, you know, this is what we have to do because this approach comes from the first principle. Alternatively, you can <clears throat> mimic your observations with simple so-called ad hoc models. And if you can reproduce with such simple models, um, observations, the dynamics of solar activity, then you can get some new uh, information. You can um, make some judgments about the sun, uh, about solar activity. And this is exactly what I'm going to show you with so-called Kuramoto model of Carlton oscillators. Well, <clears throat> I am very sorry for this slide, for the equations, because as a listener, I would prefer pictures or movies um, regarding the sun. But this part is technical. But honestly, I will show only these two equations many times, but these two. So by the end of the lecture, you will be quite accustomed to these equations. <clears throat> Let's have a look at them. Uh, these two equations uh, shows, show us uh, that the derivative of the phase theta prime is equal to the natural frequency of an oscillator, omega, plus the term, the second term, that couples the two equations. Uh, the coefficient of the coupling is denoted by k, k1 or k2. <clears throat> the coupling, this sign, is nonlinear. You can say we expect that the phase difference is small, so we will turn to a linear equation. But it is not the case. You remember the phase difference between solar proxies. It is, it is not a couple of days. The scale of the phase difference is close to a year. So it's not a small number. It is some number. We will see that the phase difference stabilizes under some natural assumptions, but stabilizes to non-small value. So we cannot, cannot linearize our equations. So to summarize, we have two oscillators, each equation represent 
represents an oscillator, and they are coupled non-linearly. We are going to consider the model with different K1 and K2. So oscillators influence each, each other non-symmetrically. <clears throat> now notation. Uh, we will use the phase difference called here theta. And we introduce the average natural frequency, which is half a sum of the natural frequencies and delta omega, which is half difference. Similarly, we introduce symmetrical and asymmetrical components. It should be, it must be components of the coupling. K and delta K as half sum and half difference of the coupling coefficients. We will see that uh, this notation has a clear physical meaning. <clears throat> so we start with the Kuramoto model I just explained. And after the change of the notation, we can sum up and subtract the two equations, and we get their equivalent uh, modification, equivalent formulation of the problem. <clears throat> Theoretical fact, if the coupling is strong, so the equations are coupled, you know, they are forced, then, uh, well, coupled, Coupling is strong means that symmetrical component is large with respect to two delta omegas. <clears throat> and in this case, uh, the second equation um, has a stationary point, and this stationary point is stable. So as time goes on, the phase difference, as I told you earlier, stabilizes stabilizes to some value. Uh, so in our equation, um, close to this uh, steady state, uh, the left-hand side of the second equation uh, is approximately zero, whereas the left-hand side uh, of the first equation <coughs> is approximately a constant. <clears throat> the, direct, <clears throat> the direct problem is to describe the stationary state uh, given all, all the coefficients. So we know K1, K2, so all Ks, all natural frequencies, and what is the limit phase difference? But it is nothing to do. <clears throat> it is nothing to do because it's, uh, you know, <clears throat> it's... Uh, uh, turns to algebraic equations, and it's it's very very simple. Uh, I'm sorry, I, for a moment I stopped sharing. I lost a part of my uh, screen. Uh, one moment, it's my technical uh, technical thing. Okay, <clears throat> now everything is good with me. Um, you share in the presentation mode? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> uh, I need I need another mode to look at as a, as a part of the screen. <clears throat> okay, uh, so uh, this problem is trivial. It's nothing to discuss. But we are interested in the inverse problem. So we know uh, we know the oscillators. We know the solution. Uh, it means that we know the left hand side of the yellow equations. Uh, we assume that the oscillators are synchronized to some frequency, and we know this frequency theta. <clears throat> then um, we know the left-hand side of the first equation, which is uh, the mean instantaneous frequency. And we know it because we know the data, we know the solution. 
we also know the natural frequencies, omega and uh, two delta omegas. And the question is, what are the coupling coefficients, k and delta k? Or we know k and delta k, we know the coupling, and we're interested in the reconstruction of natural frequencies. We will focus on the first problem. And it's also, in theory, it's nothing to do. Because we have two equations, and we have only two unknowns. Probably I have it shown uh, as, the next three, as the next screen. <clears throat> so we know the left-hand side, as I said, because uh, the left-hand side of the second equation is approximately 0. We can observe the left-hand side of uh, the first equation. And if we also know natural frequencies, then we have only two unknowns and two algebraic equations. So it's nothing to do in theory. <clears throat> However, let's relate, uh, let's, let's return to the sun. Uh, what is the problem? Let's do it step by step. First of all, what is the input of our model? We can use, as I said, two indices. Indices that I have shown you every smoothed uh, ISSN and AA index. So this input is not, uh, is not marvelous. Uh, because of, uh, of the noise, but we can smooth it first, say within four year sliding window and use these two curves as the input. The red curve is quite regular. The blue curve is not so regular, is less regular. And what is important, they do demonstrate a phase shift. So we can assume, as in theoretical model, that <clears throat> the two curves exhibit synchronization. We will return to this point a bit later. <clears throat> but what I'm going to show right now, that the correlation between the two waves determines the phase difference. You remember that. In theoretical model, I said that if we have two sine waves, we know the, uh, we know the phase difference between the two oscillators. How to compute it? Uh, the practical way is to, find, uh, is to find the correlation between the two waves. So in theoretical problem, when uh, the solution, when we deal with real equations and we associate uh, the two oscillators with the two equations, <clears throat> we can just define the coefficient of correlation in a standard manner, as you know, as in uh, basic course of probability and statistics. And if we compute these integrals, they are here just to recall the definition. Uh, clearly, we are not going to integrate something. But if we compute, if indeed we perform the computation just with uh, a pen or a pencil, we end up with a simple equation that the coefficient of correlation, the correlation between the two sine waves is equal to the cosine of the phase difference. We are going to apply this exact formula, exact equation to approximate unknown phase difference, unknown phase difference phi, when we deal with observations, with two observed waves. 
<clears throat> so we use these two curves as if they were the sine waves. They are not, but we pretend that they are, and we compute the correlation between them. If you, uh, if you are not mute, you will answer, you will ask a question. What is the window when, where we compute the correlation? We will use the window that corresponds to the solar cycle. We fix some value. Uh, it's possible to fix 11 years, but here it is fixed to a bit lesser value uh, suggested by uh, the state of the art. And the correlation, the computation of the correlation is performed within a sliding window of 10.75 years. <clears throat> then we use uh, the exact equation to estimate the phase difference. So we compute the arc cosine of the correlation and we get the approximation of um, the phase difference in the Kuramoto equations. It means that we will know theta of t. <clears throat> then, what else? Are we with just discuss formulation of the inverse problem of the Kuramoto model? We can still use that the left-hand side of the second equation is approximately zero. We can get the approximation of the left-hand side of the first equation. Equation, what is this? Let me remind that this is a proxy to the frequency of the solar cycle. So we can use the frequency that corresponds to the solar cycle, and then we need to, I don't know how, but it's another question. We have to assign some values to omega and to delta omega and find k and delta k. Is it correct? Not exactly. <clears throat> in theory, in theory, the two oscillators are synchronized. So the left-hand side, the, the derivative of the phase difference is zero or approximately zero. And in theory, uh, the phase difference is time independent. It's not the case with our approximation because we deal with the data. We are able to compute the coefficient correlation for any signals, for any two signals. But the drawback of the story is that we get time dependent phase difference. Probably it's not a drawback. In mathematics, we assume that the phase sum and the phase difference vary slowly. And what we obtain is called quasi-synchronization, some generalization of the notion of synchronization. <clears throat> so to summarize this part, our data follow sine waves. The waves are shifted with respect to each other. Uh, and our assumptions hold to some extent about quasi-synchronization. Why to some extent? Because you remember about clear exceptions we have already discussed at the very beginning of the data and uh, during the 20th cycle. 
And let me stress that nowadays we see nothing special with two graphs, but we saw something, we saw some anomaly in instantaneous period. And this anomaly underlies our main question of this part of the talk. <clears throat> Let me return to the inverse problem. In our inverse problem, we have, instead of constant in the left-hand side, uh, we have time-dependent left-hand sides of both equations, but we are able to estimate the left-hand side of both equations through the computation of the correlation of the two waves. And this gives us set of T and the derivative of set. And our knowledge of the system, uh, physical knowledge, since we know that the period of solar cycle is approximately 11 years, we know <clears throat> the left hand side of the first equation. Um, now it's a good time to explain how can we estimate um, the frequencies theta one of t and theta two of t. You remember earlier I shown you the dynamics of the instantaneous period, and I told you that it is obtained, it is derived from the instantaneous frequencies. You know, surely you know the mathematics uh, related to this topic. And you know that the most uh, popular way to obtain the instantaneous frequency deals with so-called Hilbert transform. If you Google instantaneous frequency, then your first references will be to Hilbert transform. <clears throat> but this is not what I'm going to use. I will not tell you why the Hilbert transform is not the best tool in the case, just, you know, just a hint. The Hilbert transform gives you information in a nice way about all frequencies related to the signal. <clears throat> but in this particular problem, we are interested in the specific frequency, the frequency related to the solar rotation period. It's exactly what we want to get. We want to derive, we want to derive the instantaneous solar rotation period. Not all periods that we see simultaneously, not all regularities, but just solar rotation period. <clears throat> that is why in computation, we use the Fourier transform. The Fourier transform gives us a lot of frequencies. So we compute the Fourier transform over the solar rotation period T. So we deal with daily observations and we give 11 year piece of time series as an input of the Fourier transform. <clears throat> what we obtained, we obtained first zero frequency when the zero amplitude boost, but we can forget about it, for example, subtracting the mean of the data, and then the first coefficient is reduced to zero. And the next, the first coefficient <coughs> corresponds to the solar rotation period, corresponds to the frequency, okay, of the solar rotation period. You know this mathematics, so you have the Fourier expansion, 
uh, you can make uh, the first coefficient equal to zero, as I said, subtracting the mean. Uh, but the point of interest is uh, the first coefficient, not zero coefficient, but the first coefficient. This is a complex number, and you can get the argument of this complex number and obtain the phase. And exactly this number is <clears throat> called instantaneous phase related to the solar rotation period. Uh, okay, uh, by the way, I understand that this part is very, very technical, but as I said, I have a code for everybody who is interested and I can send this code, it's commented uh, everywhere, and we will return to this, to this part and to this code at the very, very end when we'll try to answer the question. <clears throat> but now let me return to the equations as I said, I'm going to show the same equation. And as my lecture is going on, you remember this equation probably by heart and probably me too. <clears throat> as a result of the computation of the phases, of the instantaneous phases, we know the green terms. All green terms are known. They are estimated with the data. We are interested in the coupling in K and delta K, symmetrical and asymmetrical components that represent coupling between poro poloidal and toroidal components of the solar magnetic field. Now, what are omegas? What are natural frequencies? <clears throat> we have at least two possibilities to introduce omega and delta omega, at least two. First, we can guess affordable periods from oscillating data. We can use such omega and delta omega to that we mimic the range of observable periods. As I said, and you asked, and I answered, that the period in quotes vary from cycle to cycle, say from nine to 12.5 years. <clears throat> we could define the average, uh, the capital omega is the average, that in such a way that it corresponds to the average period to 11 years or to 10.75, it doesn't matter. And uh, um, omega plus delta omega will correspond to 12.5 year periods and omega minus delta omega will correspond to nine year periods. And we get so in such a way, omega and delta omega. <clears throat> uh, by the way, uh, to, to recall how to transform period to frequencies. Uh, if the period is 11 years, uh, then the frequency is approximately 0 0.57 years uh, to the power minus one. And uh, that is why we can choose omega and delta omega as in my yellow, uh, yellow highlight. But there is another possibility, also very natural. We can use other factors. We can use the meridional, meridional flow I explained you earlier, because exactly this mechanism transforms components of the magnetic field. And using known estimates, of the speed of the meridional flow, we can roughly estimate omega and delta omega. Uh, we will discuss the best choice or even the choice which is better than the best at the very end when we compare the results obtained with different values of omega and delta omega. 
But right now, let's use, uh, in some sense, both possibilities shown here and um, look at the result of modeling. So this graph have been already observed. This is the instantaneous period obtained from the data. <clears throat> now, let me return back, go backward to the equation. Uh, I'm going to use this equation to find delta k and k, but then when I find the coupling, I can use this equation to solve the direct problem, to find omegas, uh, to find uh, phases, and define the oscillators. So let me repeat. If I know delta k and k, <clears throat> I can apply the equations with known omega, delta omega, uh, delta k and k to find theta and construct two virtual oscillators, two model oscillators. The hope is that these model oscillators will follow the data. And this is indeed the case, but these graphs are not in the presentation. But <clears throat> what is in the presentation is the instantaneous period computed with the model oscillators. Here is in the graph. So you see in blue, <clears throat> you see in uh, blue the data and in green, the result of modeling. So if we compute the instantaneous period of model oscillators, we get, uh, You know, uh, let me go backward. Uh, I am very, very, I am very, very sorry uh, because it's um, it's my it's my fault. Uh, it's my fault. This is not true. Um, I know that people like when lecturer does something wrong, and now we are here, and because. Uh, I was wrong. In fact, the blue curve corresponds to the model and green curve corresponds to the data. And spectacularly, uh, the model curve is more smooth and this goes from theory, it is correct. Um, the both curves agree with each other, but what is unexpected that at the very end, the model curve goes, exhibits extreme values, anom exhibits anomaly with respect to uh, with respect to the green curve. Everywhere, uh, it looks in previous anomalies of the green curve, the the blue the model curve looks like some kind of smoothing. It's not the case at the right. And we can ask whether it's a kind of model prediction. Surely we don't know. It's only, it's only one way to look at the data, but we can, we can remember it. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to show you the reconstructed coupling. We remember that there is symmetrical component K, which is in red and asymmetrical component Delta K, which is the most interesting, mo most interesting thing here. And this is in blue. And you see that there are intervals of quite constant uh, level of 
at least symmetrical component. But sometimes there are spectacular anti-correlation between blue and red curves. The most famous and well observed interval is between 1960 and 19, um, I don't know, probably 1975. Uh, this part where my mouse is. And this anti-correlation uh, caused by anomalous behavior of AA index. You remember that at that time, AA index failed to follow the solar cycle. And you see that the Kuramoto model exposed the full desynchronization between the two components of the solar magnetic field. So what was not quite clear when we look at the, at the data directly, looked with the naked eye, we see with this model as anti-correlation between symmetrical and asymmetrical component of the solar magnetic field. Something similar was at the very beginning. You see uh, the interval from the very beginning, probably to the end of the 19th century uh, with <clears throat> episodes of anti-correlation. Let's look at the very end. And you see nothing. Uh, you see once more anomalous values of asymmetrical component, values as such. Uh, but this is a single peak. And you see that the oscillation, the, the variance of the blue curve quite large. So you cannot give a statistical proof that this last peak is significant. The question is, will we see the second peak as in the 1960s? Uh, <clears throat> let me note that this picture is obtained with the average natural frequency implemented into the model equal to the frequency related to uh, the solar rotation period. If I use an alternative, the alternative I announced earlier, so different, really very, very different values of the natural frequencies, we end up with quite similar pattern of uh, the symmetrical and non-symmetrical uh, coupling uh, components. <clears throat> but pay attention that instead of a symmetrical component, uh, delta K, I placed some normalization. And this is a correct normalization that allows to compare, uh, that allows to compare non-symmetrical component uh, with different definitions of natural frequencies. And you see the same pattern. Osc typical oscillation about uh, the same level uh, during two uh, episodes, quite stable episodes. A marvelous anti-correlation between K and delta K uh, during the 20th cycle. Uh, some kind of anti-correlation at the left, and anomalous peak of normalized asymmetrical component of the coupling at the very end. <clears throat> well, so what I said uh, summarized in this slide, so there are anomalies uh, at the left, and they were caused technical, I mean, caused by the absence of the constant phase shift between our proxies. 
remember, typically they wear, but the loss of this phase shift at the beginning underlies um, this anti-correlation at the left I just mentioned. Then anomalous 20 cycle, when when um, the two components of the solar magnetic field completely were completely desynchronized and uh, technically k and delta k attains anomalous, anomalous values as such and they anti-correlate and now nowadays uh, asymmetrical component a symmetrical component attains anomalous values. And probably, but this is speculation, there are traces of the anti-correlation between delta K and K. Okay. <clears throat> As I said, we apply some normalization of asymmetrical component. And If we draw the symmetrical component obtained with different definitions of natural frequencies, we see their almost complete coincidence. So the question I raised, what is the best choice of natural frequencies is not a question at all. So you can apply arbitrary reasoning and you get the same result. We see how nicely agree, uh, how nicely agree different graphs obtained with completely different natural frequencies. So this is not something we are going to discuss. <clears throat> this next, this current slide, now not next, this current slide, I am going to have a look at the future and to make a step to solve the enigma of nowadays quasi anomaly, anomaly or not. Uh, you remember that my previous, uh, previous uh, estimates, previous reconstructions of the coupling are smooth. Why they are smooth? Because when I use model equations, I have to find the derivatives of the curves. The derivative is, you know, is the difference between two neighboring values of the function. But if you indeed apply such a natural definition of uh, the derivative, you get very unstable results. And to get this smooth picture, instead of derivatives, I use very many sequential points, four years of points. And the derivatives were computed as a trend, a four year trend. Then the picture is quite nice. Turning from four years to one year trends, in the computation of derivatives, I get this not so smooth picture, but still you see all the details we discussed earlier, for example, anti-correlation in the 20th cycle. But now we get some more points at the end. And you see that in addition to this peak of blue curve, this blue curve goes upward at the end, but that's it. We cannot go farther, probably some more points, but not the peak or the absence of the peak. So we are waiting for another portion of data, probably two to three years. And with this method, we can get an answer. Probably other methods will lead us to the answer earlier. So this is some kind of competition. But if not, we will answer in two years with code that 
is ready to be shared, whether uh, we are experienced the epoch of complete desynchronization between toroidal and, colo and colloidal component of the solar magnetic field. Just to conclude, the Kuramoto model successfully reproduces the variation of the solar cycle duration. It describes the loss of the synchronization in the 20th cycle and uncovers traces of the current synchronization, but requires additional data for a definite conclusion. As I said, if you want to look at Python code, which is, you know, very convenient to follow at home because at each step you have a lot of pictures, a lot of additional pictures. And um, so it's quite clear, quite nicely commented on. Please write me an email and I will be happy to discuss any part of the story with any of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sasha, very much. Uh, this was a really uh, exciting lecture in terms of understanding uh, really how, as a mathematician or how theoretical uh, geophysicists, physicists are using the simple uh, models like a model to promote or can explain these uh, such a complicated uh, problems. Uh, 